But chapter 15 is important for lots of reasons. Uh, it's important because there's so much detail about the covenant that God makes with Abram. It's also important because what it, for what it means about salvation. It contains an Old Testament lesson about salvation which is applied in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul. And a after these things, God appears to, uh, in a vision, the Lord comes to Abram again. And he says in verse 1, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward will be very great. Now, Abram has waited for a little while by this time. He's married to this beautiful woman. He's treating her like his wife. He gets older, she gets older, but her tummy does not get big. Her tummy's still flat. There's still no baby. And so Abram has reached the, the point where he's probably thought, you know, the next time I have an interview with God, I'm going to ask for a clarification. And meanwhile, Abram has been figuring out the practical ways that God may be planning to keep the promise. Ways that can be explained through our logic. Ways that be, can be explained through our theology. Ways that can be explained through our biology. Ways that can be explained through our law. Abram lived in a place and in a time where if a great man died childish, childless, Sometimes his heir was his chief servant, his trusted servant. We have a famous situation in America where a servant just inherited a great, great fortune. The servant was Indonesian, and he served this family for over 30 years. And when the last person in the family died, there were no children. One reason there were no children because they weren't the kind of people who got married, I'll put it that way. And the servant ended up with millions. That was a huge story in America two years ago. Uh, excuse me, two weeks ago. And um, in this case, Abraham is thinking, well, maybe God is going to give me descendants through my servant, my chief servant, the servant that I love who's been with me for so long. Uh, Eliezer of Damascus. That's what he says to God in verse 2. Uh, in verse 3, he says, You haven't given me any children, so maybe this one who was born in my house and his children are going to be my children. Verse 4, God speaks. This man will not be your heir. One who shall come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. So here's what he tells him. He says, no, you will be the biological father of the son and the descendants I'm talking about. You will be their biological father. Not just their legal father, but their biological father. Then he says, come outside. He would already told him that his descendants were going to be as many as the dust of the ground, which can't be numbered. Then he says, he takes him outside. Now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. So shall your descendants be. Do you know that in the Middle Ages, the best scientists in the world thought that the stars could be counted? They thought there were about 1,500 stars. Now we know that the stars cannot be counted because there are so many of them. And basically what he's saying is that you, no one will be able to count your descendants. There will be so many of them. Now look at verse 6. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Along with, um, along with the verse, the just shall live by faith. This is the most important verse in the Old Testament which helps us understand our salvation, what salvation is and what salvation is not. We said that Genesis 15, 6 is a real key to understanding our, even our salvation from the Old Testament. 
along with Habakkuk 2.4. Habakkuk 2.4 says, The just, the righteous man, shall live by faith. Genesis 15.6 says that when Abram believed in the Lord, the Lord counted that belief to Abram as righteousness. In other words, his faith had the same value in God's eyes as, as righteousness would have had. We'll come back to that. I think what I'd like to do is finish chapter 15, and then we'll come back and talk more about the significance of verse 6. And just as, the, just as we went to the New Testament to see what the New Testament said about Melchizedek, we'll go to the New Testament again to see what the New Testament says about Abram's faith in Genesis 15, 6. But there follows this uh, great um, declaration uh, an amazing ceremony, a ritual of covenant making conducted by God for the sake of Abraham. Uh, Abram asked the question, which maybe shows that his faith is not so strong, how am I going to know that you're going to give me all this land? Maybe that's one way he's saying, when is it going to happen? Where's the evidence of it? God says, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Isn't that interesting? Abram says to God, how will I know that you're going to give something to me? And God says, well, we'll begin by you giving something to me. Bring these animals for sacrifice. So. Abram brought the animals, he cut them in two, he laid one half of the butchered animals on one side of the altar, the other half on the other side of the altar, and he prepares for the ritual. Now, there's a little parenthesis here, and it's an amazing thing. It's amazing because it's noted, um, but also it's amazing when we think about the spiritual lesson that it brings. It says in verse 11 that the birds of prey, what we call buzzards or vultures, flew down onto the altar and tried to steal away the animals for sacrifice. In other words, the birds of the sky, the vultures, tried to steal what had been offered to God off the altar, and it said that Abraham had to drive them away. Think about that. I mean, God is present. God is speaking. God is about to show Abram what he's going to do for him by the enactment of a solemn covenant ritual. But God doesn't keep the birds away. Abram has to do that. Think about that. <laughs> we may be in so many situations in our life situations which are spiritually important, situations which involve the growth of our own faith, situations which may involve ministry and our helping someone else to grow their faith. And just in the middle of the most important part of it, something stupid and irritating happens that we have to go deal with. And at that moment, we're tempted to ask ourselves the question, is God really doing anything here? Is God really present? Is God really in control? If God is present and in control, why are all these other aggravating, distracting things happen? And yet, and yet, it happened in the case of Abram. We know he was present there. We know he was in control there. And yet he allowed these stupid birds to fly down and almost mess everything up. You know, you lay the portions of the sacrifice out on the altar to prepare for a solemn ritual with God. God is present, and all of a sudden the birds fly down and try to mess everything up. It's crazy. And yet it happened. It happened. Things like that happen in this world. God arranges our life in such a way to allow us to be faithful. 
God does not arrange our life in such a way that we're never bothered, that we're never inconvenienced, that we're never irritated, that we're never provoked. We're not in heaven yet. We still have a ways to go, okay? So, after Abram drives the birds away, a deep sleep falls upon Abram. And it says that he got scared. After it got dark, he, he went to sleep, not a normal sleep, but a sleep which frightened him. And God tells him in verse 13, I want you to understand this, Abram. Your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. The captivity in Egypt, the sojourn in Egypt, was predicted and prophesied by God before it happened. It was not an interruption to God's plan. It was not something God did not know about. It was not something God did not control. It was a part of God's plan. Was it a terrible, awful thing to think would have to happen to your children and your children's children that they'd be slaves for 400 years? And I mean, you know, Abraham says, how am I going to know that you're going to do all these wonderful things to me? And the first thing he tells him is that for 400 years, his descendants are going to be slaves. Wow. That must have been hard news. Then he says in verse 14, But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterwards they will come out with many possessions. Let me, let me just say something right here. Um, 400 years is a long time. You know what that means? That means a lot of Israelites were born slaves and died slaves. That means that many Israelites lived their whole life before they ever saw the fulfillment of the promise, which is one thing that we're being taught in Hebrews 11. Many times we think our lives are a tragedy if certain things don't happen within a certain time frame. It would only be a tragedy if when you died, it was all over. Let me ask you a question, Christian. How long do you think eternity is? And how long do you think your life is compared to eternity? Now think how foolish it is to say to the eternal God, who has no beginning and no end, and we talked about that in the very first verse of chapter 1, how foolish is it to say to the eternal God, either you bless me within the parameters of my biological life or I'm not interested. I'm not excited about it. I'm not encouraged. If you don't bless me before I die physically, I'm really not interested. How stupid would that be? Even if we live to be 80 years old, we haven't even begun yet to see what God is going to do, to see His blessing. There was a man called A.B. Bruce, and he said that Jesus was always trying to teach His disciples one of four things, and one of those four things was to develop an eternal perspective. To develop an eternal perspective. By analogy, you and I may live in a time period which is like the the 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And we may look around and say, where's the blessing or where's the fulfillment of the blessing? The important thing is to know that we will be blessed. And the important thing is to serve God and to be faithful to God in our generation, to be a part of the blessing for other generations. I will bring them out. He says in verse 15, you'll die in peace. You'll live a long time and you'll die in peace. But in the fourth generation, um, your children will come back here. They'll come back here to Canaan. Uh, it, came, it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark 
and there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch. There was something that was on fire, and the fire was lit by God, which passed across the altar between the two pieces of um, slaughtered animals, the two portions of sacrificed animals. And evidently in the ancient Near East, when two people made a treaty, uh, they would cut up the animals and they would walk between the animals. And basically what they were saying in the treaty was, if you break this covenant, may it happen to you what's happened to these animals. May you be cut in two. But here God Himself passes between the pieces of sacrificed animals laid upon the altar. And then it says in verse 18 that He makes the covenant with Abram and He says, to your descendants I will give this land. He talks about the borders of the land and He talks about the ten nations, the ten pagan tribes who are currently living in the land. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com.